So yeah, my name is Dora and I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, Imagine Labs. And uh, we have made an introductory coding platform as well as this little gadget, the Imagine Charm, which is for those who know what a Tamagotchi is, it's a bit like a Tamagotchi that you can code. Uh, so that's how we motivate kids and specifically girls and non-binary to uh, explore coding through creativity and self-expression. And it's been uh, out on the market for about two years. So we have over 25,000 users and 80% are girls and non-binary, 20% uh, boys. Um, and also now launched a new product uh, which is going to be used in schools. Hi everyone, I'm Swara. I'm the founder and president of the Period Society, which is a student-run nonprofit that works um, all over India um, with the dual goal of both ending the menstrual taboo by um, educating people about the biology of menstruation um, using medically verified educational um, modules which are delivered in local languages by volunteers um, all over India, and also um, ending period poverty by um, increasing access to period products, especially um, eco-friendly and sustainable ones. Um, depending on um, the access to like sanitation and water supply that the communities we work with have. And um, we're looking forward to kind of expand into the space of sexual and reproductive health as well and um, work more in the education sector to um, mandate like a comprehensive sex education program which a lot of schools in India are still lack and which is kind of where the problem still stems from. Wonderful, thank you. Hi there everyone, I'm Sarai Fuladi, founder and CEO of JARA. I'm an electrical engineer by training and we build the JARA unit. It's our off-grid charging e-learning device that helps children who live in very high poverty, low internet and off-grid communities get access to e-learning and distance learning anywhere, anytime. Charges off-grid with crank power and solar power. And i um, very honored to be here. There's about 800 million children in these communities that need something like this ASAP. Um, so, yeah, grateful to be here and looking forward to answering your questions. Hi everyone, my name is Akola Thompson and I'm from Guyana. I'm the founder of Tamaki Feminist. So Tamaki is an indigenous patrimonial word, it means community. Because that's really what we aim to really build in Guyana. So we focus a lot on public education and community development. More recently, we worked with the government to develop an app called iMatter. And what it does, it provides accessible information to persons across all regions in Guyana on where they can access GBV services, because this is a issue that is not, uh, a lot of knowledge is not available in the area. So these are some of the things that we've been doing. I'm happy to be sharing space with these amazing change makers. Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so my name is Beth. Um, I'm a human rights defender from Thailand. I live back in Chiang Mai, Thailand. I founded um, um, LGBT youth community. We are the survivor of the unfair discrimination, so that's why we gather together. So what we do is like we do the youth leadership workshop. We do the um, online content. We have quite small amount, like forty thousand followers. And <laughs> then um, we do like advocacy, like international advocacy with the UN as well. We get the UPR recommendation on the LGBTQ youth and. Um, recently, we're trying to um, create um, the first national like diversity and inclusion for the university and higher education in Thailand, so they can you know implement this um, for their employee, professor, and lastly, I'm becoming a student again. I'm kind of like um, unemployed because I'm, I got a scholarship from the um, Shivani, so I'm going to study the, at the UCL about education and international development. Ooh. So coming back to Thailand, I will try to implement the first um, national diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Uh, evening, you guys. My name is Noja Sad. I come from my small town in Iraq. So I have a massive passion for the gender equality and digital health inclusion of rural and marginalized communities, especially since you know, I firmly believe that there is a historic and huge rural urban divide you know, in terms of human rights, infrastructure, and even basic access to essential life services. Uh, governments have always seen investments in rural communities as a thing of the lowest priority and have left it all up to the work of the nonprofits, which are already underfunded and limited in their outreach. 
So personally, I believe that digital technologies are a superpower that each one of us holds in this room right now. And I, I truly believe that we can leverage this technology to change entire systems and communities from the comfort of our own homes or even offices. I also believe that each person is unique and special. So I always like strive to listen and you know, hold my beliefs aside to figure out you know, what, where this person's uniqueness comes from. It's a great pleasure to be here and I can't wait to hear your questions. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abdul Rashid, and I'm from Niger, West Africa. Um, how many of you know Niger or have heard of Niger here? Not Nigeria, Niger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah because most people are like Nigerian. All right. Um, I'm the co founder and president of the Sahel Solar Academy, which is a non profit institution. Uh, training the 21st century workforce in the field of solar energy and irrigation system. Uh, we train especially women from the rural communities. Thank you. I think, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for, for sharing not only everything that you've shared with us today, but also for being here. I think, uh, sensitive of time, I really want to open up the, the Q&A for you guys, see if you have any questions. Just raise your hand, feel free to, uh, to ask any questions. We have amazing panelists that are just kind of really dying to hear from you. So thank you so much. I missed the presentation stage. So a lot of my friends told me that I missed something really bad. I wanted to be here to listen to you again. Um, so yeah, I really wanted to know about Swara since I'm from India. And we know that period is a taboo there. We don't talk about in the families. We don't talk about in the schools, right? So what motivated you to start to do this and like, uh, what you want from us as individuals to like, co coordinate with you or help you to take it more further. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that question. So I just to like first address like the first part of like what motivated me. Um, I think it was really just like my own personal experience that a lot of people share um, growing up in India like a ho household with healthcare professionals. Um, but when I got my first period, I like, absolutely wasn't prepared for it. Like my mom was like really awkward talking to me about it. Um, I had like really heavy like bleeding and like horrible cramps. So like my dad was a physician, but when I asked him to like you know get me medication or something, he just like literally told me like it's a girl thing. Like why don't you address it with mom? And I never really had like this sort of like awkwardness with my parents when it came to talking about anything else. And then just noticing like a lot of the restrictions and the taboos, such as like not going to the temple, um, you know, being asked not to go to people's houses during a festival if you're on your period, and like. Some of my friends are asked like not to touch the pickle jar, like all sorts of like absurd things because people believe that menstrual blood makes you impure. And then the second part of like interacting with people who couldn't afford period products and just being unable to imagine like how do you go on with your life and just, you know, like function as a normal person in society like while you're bleeding without access to like a pad or something like that. Um, in terms of what people can do, um, I really think it's important to emphasize that like you don't have to like start a nonprofit like if you don't have the time or anything to make an impact. Like if you can even like spark the conversation in your own circle or like educate like younger kids in your family about menstruation or like advocate for a comprehensive sex education program at your school and just um, you know say the word period aloud instead of using euphemisms, I think that itself like goes a long way in just like normalizing menstruation which is like a really like hidden and visible like topic in society and then there's obviously like more that you can do such as like um, making sure your workplace is, is um, equipped with free period products in the bathrooms or like you're having period products in bathrooms for people of all genders um, but I think just normalizing the use of the word period and talking about it in your own circle is a very powerful step. We had another question on this side. Hello everyone, thank you. I was at the presentation stage and I was absolutely blown by all of your speeches, truly inspiring. Um, so my question is to Suraya, am I right? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, so my question is, it's, it's great what you're doing, e-learning, e-distance learning, and uh, being a woman in tech, um, I want you to understand, uh, how do you, I mean, it's great that you have the, you're providing them with a tool for the access, right? But how do you make people 
you know, use your product. You know what I mean? Like, uh, in, when, when you come to a country like India, you have families which don't let the women go out and learn. They don't let them go to the school, right? So the problem is not really about uh, not having educational centers, but more about the families really being forward about it, right? So I just want to understand, how do you do that? Uh, I know you have volunteers who update information, but do they, do they go and, I would say, preach, for the lack of a good word, about uh, your product? Yeah, thank you so much. That's a really important question that we spent a lot of time you know, with communities trying to figure out how do, how do we make that happen? How do we ensure that the girls whose families don't want to support their education get the education they need? Um, because those are the ones that are most often left behind. So what do we do about that? Um, we found out why are like, you know, some of the core reasons why a lot of them is a lot of the families want the girls to be at home during the day to take care of the house or the farm and just to be the time to be spent doing other things. And also the, you know, cost of education, if they had any money and they have to pay, they always put it towards the boys first. So we deal with both of those things. First, in terms of cost, children are not paying for this, families are not paying for this, schools are not even paying for this, neither are teachers. Um, we sell these to governments, we sell them to INGOs and local NGOs too, and we also sell them to corporations too. And then we have our program, which is all localized, local facing and more. Um, so to address the families that, for example, don't support their children, for a lot of them time was what the thing is. So the nice thing about this is children, girls especially, can use this at night um, when they're you know, not busy. Um, taking care of the house or the family, they could do it on their own time, and that helps a lot of these parents be convinced enough, okay, and it's free, okay, fine, I'll let my child have it. And then later they see the positive effects later, which is lovely. Um, and then the second, I, well, I had another point. Um, let's see, no, I think I just both, yeah, the cost and then time, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question, it's very important yeah, to us, thank you. Gentleman in the back there. <laughs> no, no, no. It was before. It was before, but idea. yeah. Go ahead. No, no, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm curious about the technology itself. Um, the first question's a bit more forward, and that's what's the cost to create the actual device? Um, and the second question is, in terms of the curriculum, what is um, the curriculum base point? Is it a national curriculum? Um, and my third bit, and that will be the last question, is you mentioned you have volunteers who will be the people updating it. How is that sustainable if it's dependent on bodies being there to actually physically go around and find however many millions you have you know, across the world to ensure that the children aren't learning things from 2010? Yeah, fantastic question, firstly. Thank you so much. Um, so to address the first question was, um, let's see, oh, if, you guys, if you do one at a time, that'll be helpful. What was the first question again? Cost. Yes, cost to create. Thank you. Um, so yeah, cost to create is, you know, as we have smaller batches to start, the costs are higher, but then um, we'll get very low cost within the next two years, which is nice. Um, so to create them, we're trying to bring it down to anywhere from 15 to 20 US dollars to create. Um, and then um, the second question was, if you could just remind me, please, that'd be very helpful. <laughs> Curriculum. curriculum, yes, yeah. curriculum. So, um, yeah, so we partner with local e-learning platforms in each uh, in each country. And during the pandemic, especially, many governments digitized K to twelve curriculum. Um, so, the priority curriculum is just first traditional K to twelve curriculum. What are the core subjects the children need in their schools to pass national exams? Passing national exams is extremely important because in a lot of countries, students get kicked out of the school system if they fail those. So, first keep them in the school system, but we all know the things we learn as a core curriculum doesn't always give us what we need to learn to be able to realize our dreams or just even participate in the economy or you know, be able to get to higher ed or jobs. So we include the skills on top of that that they actually do need. So it's kind of a combo of both and the content is 100% culturally and language-wise localized. Um, so that's how we're able to customize it. And then sustainability for distribution um, and updating content. So we're doing job creation um, in these communities. So the JAR ambassadors we hire are paid full time um, and they work alongside the teachers and students because one of the big um, barriers for most ed tech to enter communities is that um, a lot of it, the, the, it's put on the teachers to be in charge of the whole new technology. Teachers don't have the time or energy, it's just too, it's too much for them to do their normal stuff plus add ed tech in there. So it's important you have a supplement to person to be in charge of the ed tech itself. 
Um, so that's the JAR ambassador is able to do that, and they enter. Uh, they do. They work with the schools every two to three days to do updates, pull data, work with the teachers too, um, and it also helps the students kind of have a mentor to support their and continue their education. And um, you know, our vision is to have um, thousands and thousands of JAR ambassadors who are you know working to make this happen, creating a lot of jobs locally through that. Thank you so much. Very important question. I appreciate it. In the back, do we have a question in the back, or can we come to the front? Oh, there's a question in the back. Hi, just a quick question around, um, I guess, global gender equality. I remember reading a report by the World Economic Forum that estimated we will reach global gender parity across all aspects of workplace, home, culturally in 100 years, which to me uh, sounded ridiculous. Uh, so I'm just wondering, then this is a question to the broader group, just want to get your views on that and what you think we could be doing to really accelerate that. Are there some fundamentals that we could do to really accelerate um, that journey towards gender parity? I think it was actually 200 years now this was mentioned on the, <laughs> on the stage. But I, I would just quickly jump in that I think what's beautiful about this kind of set of initiatives that we have here, that there's like no one solution that will solve it. So you kind of really need, like we have so different solutions. And I think it's a combination of all of this that kind of needs to happen and succeed uh, to actually <laughs> move the needle. So that's sort of maybe not a sat really satisfying answer, but I think, you know, supporting any and all initiatives and probably the ones that are like closest to your heart uh, make the most sense. Yeah, I wanted to add, that's an excellent question. So I think the biggest and the simplest solution is just, you know, engaging men and boys and educating them about gender equality. It, like they should be at the forefront, you know, of leading this movement because this is called gender equality. It's not called women's rights. So it does definitely involve, you know, men as well. You know, we're seeing like most of the actually, you know, the society sectors are dominated by men, especially in our, you know, like, in the global south countries. I mean, we're seeing the government, you know, the private sector, even nonprofits are actually mostly dominated by men. I mean, one example in my country, uh, we're seeing like more political representation of women, but it's, I would say like, unfortunately, it's nothing more than tokenism because, you know, actually these women are actually, you know, controlled by the political parties or the men that are superior to them you know, with every decision that they make, with every move or every even speech that they, you know, do, it's all controlled and staged. So they don't have, like, the freedom to fully express themselves. I'm not saying there should not, should not be women in political presentation because, you know, they don't have an influence. Of course, I mean, representation matters. You know, seeing young girls growing up in a country, seeing women leaders, it's amazing. But we need, you know, proper and meaningful representation of women in all sectors of the society especially the government and economics. Just sensitive of time, I think I'm just going to ask Abdul, Best, Akola, if there's anything as well that you'd like to add on to that question as well, or regarding any of the before ones. Yes, actually. So I do know the estimate that you're talking about, and that has actually risen due to COVID-19. Yeah. And a lot of the progress that has been made has kind of been eradicated because of the health crisis. And so there's a, as they said, it's a multi-sectional approach. You really have to focus on women's employment, economic empowerment, political participation. These are all important areas that we really need to address because women are on the front center. We are the most vulnerable when it comes to these issues. And I do agree that it's important for men to be involved in the conversation. But I do not think that, uh, you know, we should really be putting forward a narrative that men should be spearheading that because I think it's a dangerous one because women and girls are the ones that continue to face tremendous harm on the front lines and men of course can support the work that they're doing in their own spaces amongst their own people. Yes. I think I have 20 minutes, or oh, 20 seconds. <laughs> so, so just trying to be easy, I think as I mentioned earlier, just like full, equal and meaningful participation of the woman. So that would be the goal for like, um, to have the gender parity and like, um, to have their meaningful um, participation. You mentioned about um, the women in politics. So recently we have the local election that we elected a lot of like women in Thailand in local um, politics. But yeah, as you mentioned, that a lot of them doesn't really represent um, uh, the women in Thailand and doesn't call for the rights for the women. Um, even though I mentioned about the Gender Equality Act, none of them trying to promote this law, but 
the the committee of the law the, of this existing law claim that oh you see we have the gender equality act right now so that's why we elected a lot of women but at the end of the day these women are never promote this law never promote um, the effective implementation of this existing law to promote the gender equality in Thailand. 